Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. We continue our biochemistry playlist. In the previous video, we have talked about vitamin E. Today, it's time for vitamin D, the cholecalciferol, or the ergocalciferol. Sunlight is just awesome, but it can increase your risk of melanoma. So, let's get started. This is my biochemistry playlist, and we are talking about vitamin D today. In the next video, it's going to be vitamin A. And now let me tell you the story of 10 different patients who have one thing in common. Let's start with this dude right here. He had GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, aka heartburn, which has nothing to do with the heart, except for the fact that if you have right-sided heart disease, you might suffer from symptoms similar to GERD, and if your doctor is a doofus, he will, oh, just take a pill and you'll be fine, but then you will die from a heart disease. But other than that, heartburn has nothing, nothing to do with the heart. So, went to the doc, doc gave him a pill for a very long time. We're talking years here, and the doctor was a doofus because he did not check his labs regularly, he did not ask about symptoms regularly. Later, this poor dude developed bone fractures, transverse ridging on the biting surface of his teeth, and muscle weakness. What is this? Second patient, this is not a real story by the way, imagine that my hero, Dr. Thomas Soul, moved from sunny California and went to live in northern Alberta, Canada, but later he developed a femur fracture. I will actually cry. Not because he moved to Canada, but because of the femur fracture, because at his age, because at his age, femur fractures carry a higher fatality rate than a freaking heart attack. My great mentor, Dr. Thomas Soul, is 91 and he has just published a book last year. I'm in my 20s and I cannot even publish a freaking brochure. My generation is doomed. Patient 3 is a lady who practices purda or parda or a scientist who spends the entire freaking day indoors in the lab. These people developed hip fractures. What is purda, you might ask? It's the practice which involves seclusion of women from public observation by means of concealing clothing such as a veil. Our fourth patient is a young kid. When you tap the kid's cheek, this will happen. It's contraction to one size and it's an exaggerated spasm. When you wrap the blood pressure cuff around the arm or the leg, the kid developed carpal spasms and pedal spasm respectively. This condition can be serious and it can lead to laryngeal spasm and failure to breathe. Patient number five presented to you and the eye looked like this. What is this? This is a band. Yes, where is the band? It's in the cornea. And the cornea has keratin. That's why it's called keratin. What is pathy? It's pathology. It's a pathology in the cornea that looks like a freaking band. And this looks grayish, whitish, such as the precipitate that you used to see in the lab on those good old chemistry classes. But hey, medicosis, I'm just a poor freaking family doctor. I don't have a slit lamp to be able to see the band keratopathy. Shut up. You don't need a slit lamp, just good source of light and you need to know where to look. The eye can see what the brain knows. If you have never heard of band keratopathy, you're not gonna find anything because you don't know what to expect. Patient number six who came to you with muscle dystrophy. You thought of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, good job, and you did this Gower maneuver, but the Gower sign here was negative. In other words, this did not happen in the kid. Case number seven is the story of the fair-skinned dermatologist with OCD. He shies from sunlight like the devil shies from incense. The biggest hat that I've ever seen in real life was that of a freaking dermatologist. To those who are hammers, everything looks like a nail. I get it, he's worried about his skin from actinic keratosis, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, etc. But he takes it too far with these hats and the sunblock. Later, he developed bone fractures. Patient number eight is a young kid from Scandinavia. Every day, he cuffs up cupfuls of pus. His parents have to change his position every time in order to get all of this gunk out of his lungs, twice a day. When you did a CT scan of the lungs, you found dilation of those bronchi and the pancreas had fibrosis and cysts. 
When you looked at the patient's teeth, there were transverse ridging of the teeth like this on the biting surface. Lab results were significant for decreased amylase and lipase. Patient number 9 is elderly, obese, with chronic kidney disease, and he developed bone fractures. Patient number 10, please forgive my jokes, is the story of the kid whose father is a corporate lawyer who lives in the suburbs, and his mama is a total Karen who grows her own vegetables. This poor baby was strictly breastfed. His mommy did not expose him to sunlight because I fear that he may develop melanoma. She fed him soy-based formula afterwards, and she will never buy any milk because what if my baby is lactose intolerant? And then she will not feed him peanuts because what if my kid develops peanut allergy? She never gave him any supplements because supplements are from the devil. They are manufactured by those big, greedy, evil corporations who are poisoning the water. She never gave him fortified food because fortification is done by the government who has blood on its hands. This child developed a rachitic rosary, Harrison sulcus, pigeon chest or pictus carniatum, and as you know, what is pictus carniatum or carniatum? The word carina means the keel of the boat. Imagine that this is the boat and this is the water and this is an anterior posterior view. The keel of the boat is this, it's bulging outwards. When the baby's chest is bulging out outwards, we call this pictus carniatum or pigeon chest. Moreover, there were craniotabies, frontal bossing, delayed closure of the fontanelles, genovarum, and bowing of the bones. What all these people had in common was vitamin D deficiency. This is how medicine should be taught, not like your freaking professor with his PowerPoint. Look, here is the deal. When you go to hell, here are the people that you will see in hell in this order. Number one, serial killers. Number two, rapists. Number three, thieves. Number four, freaking politicians. Number five, professors who use PowerPoint. What are you doing with your life? Today we'll talk about vitamins, specifically vitamin D, its chemistry, sources, metabolism, deficiency, and excess. Vitamins are essential molecules, your body cannot make them, therefore you have to eat them in the diet, or get them from sunlight, in case of vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, as you see, and therefore deficiency is less likely, but toxicity is more likely, at least theoretically. Fat-soluble vitamins need a robust gut, a competent liver, and a doozy pancreas to be absorbed. If I have any problems in my gut, pancreas, or in my liver, aka malabsorption syndrome, I can develop deficiency of these vitamins. Most of these pills have about 700 international units of vitamin D3, according to the guidelines. However, the Linus Pauling Institute of Oregon University recommends 2,000 international units per day. Professor Bruce Ames, who is a professor in UC Berkeley and one of the most cited scientists in all fields in all times, takes 5,000 international units per day, but he sits in the lab all day. Also, the guy is 90-something and he can still give a lecture, so he probably knows what the flip he's doing. But just because it's working for him doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna work for everybody. I'm just giving you the facts and you can make your own decision. Talk to your doctor if you have any questions. Okay, these are vitamins B1, thiamine, B2, riboflavin. we know all of this. If you can summarize vitamin K in one word, it's carboxylation. Vitamin A, it's antioxidant. Vitamin C, hydroxylase. And vitamin D, mineralization. Bone, baby. Vitamin D3 is the active form of vitamin D. It's even more active than vitamin D2. Okay, vitamin D3 can be called cholecalciferol. Let's dissect that. Why do we call it all? Because it's a steroid. It's like cortisol. All because it has OH, chemically speaking. Why calci? Because it tries to maintain a robust calcium level in the blood. Why coli? The word coli means liver related. That's why we call it cholesterol. It's a steroid made in the liver. Watch my cardiac pharmacology playlist on YouTube, especially my video on statins. How do I get vitamin D? Sunlight is the best source. How about the diet? Fish, liver, oil is the best source. What's the difference between vitamin D2 and vitamin D3? Vitamin D2 comes from the plant. It's called ergosterol when it's in the pro-vitamin form. And then, thanks to ultraviolet light, specifically UVB light, we have UVA and UVB. 
This will lead to intramolecular rearrangement of the provitamin to become a freaking vitamin. And this will be vitamin D2, also known as ergo calciferol. In your skin, you have 7 dehydrocholesterol. I freaking told you that vitamin D comes from cholesterol. And who makes the stinking thing? Your liver does. Thanks to UVB lights from the sunlight, you get vitamin D3. This is the active form of vitamin D, and this is the cholecalciferol, the most active form. Hey, medicosis, which one is more active, D2 or D3? D3 is more active. Sources of vitamin D, we have natural and we have artificial. Artificial, of course, are the pills or supplements or whatever. Natural, we have sunlight, the best, and we have diet. Diet is not as good as sunlight. The best is fish liver oil. Some fish have lots of vitamin D, especially mackerel. Egg yolk might have some vitamin D. Margarine butter, yup. Lord cheese how about if i eat green leafy vegetables green leafy vegetables do have ergosterol however whether you will absorb them or not is an open question rather than a foregone conclusion what are the functions of vitamin d intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphate it helps mineralize your bones immune system modulator insulin secretion maybe and blood pressure regulator as we have discussed before, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, therefore it needs your pancreas to secrete lipase, colipase, cholesterol trace, and phospholipase to digest those dietary... And you will need your robust liver and gallbladder, and of course, you will need your intestine to absorb all of this. So you eat the diet that has some vitamin D into your intestine, hopefully it will be absorbed, and this is called 7-dehydrocholesterol, or it could be the ergo if you're eating plants. But the best one is the 7-dehydrocortisol. Okay, intestine and then liver. Okay, liver, because this is fat-soluble vitamin. And then liver will send it to your skin. Fine, you'll be exposed to sunlight, unless you're sitting on your butt on the couch all day. The UVB light will activate vitamin D into the active form of vitamin D. Let's talk about it again. The provitamin was the 7-dehydrocholesterol. Thank your gut, thank your liver. And then send it to the skin as cholecalciferol. Why does it have an all? Because it has an OH. It has one OH as of this point. If it ends in all and it's made of cholesterol, do you think it's water-soluble or fat-soluble? Of course, fat-soluble. Therefore, it cannot float in the blood. You have to dump it on a plasma protein. In this case, it's a D-binding protein, which is a freaking globulin. And then give it to the liver again. Why? To add another hydroxyl group. What's the name of the enzyme? 25 hydroxylase. Ace, because it's an enzyme. Hydroxyl, because it adds a hydroxyl group. 25, because it adds the hydroxyl group onto carbon number 25. And now this molecule has two hydroxyl groups, and we call it calcifidiol. Di, because it's two or you can call it 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. It's the cholecalciferol after adding a hydroxyl group at carbon number 25. This hydroxylation process requires three cofactors, magnesium, NADPH, and molecular oxygen. And that's why the patient with GERD, who was taking a PEL protein pump inhibitor, developed hypomagnesemia, and therefore vitamin D deficiency, and therefore hypocalcemia, and therefore bone fractures. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. And here is an example of a mineral deficiency leading to a vitamin deficiency, which will then later cause another mineral deficiency. That was beautiful what I've just said. So this is the 25-hydroxycholecalciferol or calcifidiol or calcidiol. Okay, and of course, if you have too much of this, negative feedback, baby, it's going to inhibit this enzyme. Okay, back to the 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. It will go to the kidney, specif specifically the mitochondria of the kidney because it has the 1-alpha-hydroxylase enzyme. Another hydroxylase will add another hydroxyl group at position number 1. And now this molecule is called 1 and 25 dihydroxy, so 2 hydroxy, cholecalciferol, which already has one hydroxyl group, and therefore this molecule has three hydroxyl groups. We can call it calcitriol. This is the most active form of vitamin D, hands down. Function is trying to maintain your calcium and phosphate. And that's why if you have hypocalcemia, you will boost this enzyme even more because you want some vitamin D to raise your calcium up. 
Conversely, if you have tons of calcitriol, it will get this active vitamin D and convert it into inactive vitamin D, such as 24 and 25 dihydroxy or 1, 24, 25 dihydroxy, also known as calcitetrol. Tetra means 4. Moreover, if you have too much calcitriol, negative feedback, baby, is going to inhibit 1-alpha hydroxylase. The 1-alpha hydroxylase requires 3 cofactors and 3 other enzymes. If your freaking professor explained it like this, I will retire from YouTube and work as a whopper flopper. The story of parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. Let's start by the parathyroid hormone. Where the flip does it come from? From the parathyroid gland, which are on the posterior aspect of your thyroid gland. Parathyroid hormone has one job in life and one life only. It's to increase your calcium in the serum. How? Absorption, reabsorption, resorption. What do you mean by absorption? Absorption of calcium in the gut. What do you mean by reabsorption? Reabsorption of calcium in the kidney. What do you mean by resorption? Resorption of bone, breakdown of bone to release the calcium from within the bone and into the blood. But this PTH is a phosphate trashing hormone, so to speak. It decreases your serum phosphate. Calcitonin, however, which comes from the thyroid gland, specifically the parafollicular or C cells of the thyroid gland, will do the following. Decrease serum calcium, and this is opposite to PTH, and decrease serum phosphate, which is like PTH. And this is the story of two neighbors, PTH and calcitonin, because one comes from the parathyroid and the other comes from the thyroid. These are neighbors, yet they are enemies. One tries to increase serum calcium, but one tries to decrease serum calcium. However, these two enemies colluded together. Both of them have decided to trash your phosphate, which is not fun, because if you know, the energy currency of your body is called ATP. What does the P stand for? Phosphate. Without phosphate, there is no energy. Without energy, there is no metabolism. Without metabolism, you will die. So here is what PTH does to calcium and phosphate on every organ. And here is what calcitonin did. If you have noticed, both of them have decided to trash phosphate. Ergo, vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 realized that the previous two hormones are doofuses. Both of them decrease serum phosphate by dumping it in the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. So vitamin D3 decided, I am the only one that I'm gonna save the day and increase phosphate so that you might have some ATP. I will increase serum phosphate unlike the other two idiots. However, I will obey my father, because like father, like son, PTH is my father. How come? PTH stimulated the formation of 1-alpha-hydroxylase, which was the reason for my existence. So I will say thank you, daddy, and I will raise the serum calcium like father, like son. In a nutshell, vitamin D will increase serum calcium and serum phosphate. How did vitamin D3 increase serum calcium and serum phosphate? By increasing calcium absorption in the gut and by adding calcium binding protein to help with this process. By increasing phosphate absorption in the gut, by increasing calcium reabsorption and phosphate reabsorption. And then, vitamin D has a brain. If your calcium level in the blood is low, I will destroy some bone and get you some calcium. But if you have too much calcium in the blood, I will take that calcium by its hand and just ram it into bones. So here is an entire physiology lecture in 10 seconds. PTH, increase calcium, decrease phosphate. Calcitonin, decrease everything. Vitamin D3, I have a brain. Both of them trash the phosphate. I will increase the phosphate. And I will say thank you to daddy by increasing serum calcium like father, like son. Get a blank piece of paper and draw everything in this chart. Otherwise, there is no hope for you. Okay, Medicosis, now I understand that vitamin D is trying to maintain my calcium by acting on bone, gut, and kidney. We call these the target organs. Okay. But how about the receptor? Oh, the receptor of vitamin D is known as the zinc finger. Oh, by the way, I made a mistake. The receptor should not be on the outside because vitamin D3 is fat-soluble. Fat-soluble can enter into the cell because the cell membrane is made of fat. It's called lipid bilayer. So fat can enter into fat. Therefore, the receptor is inside. It's in the nucleus. Like this, the receptor is on the nucleus. And this vitamin D receptor is a zinc finger. Is this like my middle finger? Shut up, you pathetic piece of melon. A zinc finger is something related to your DNA, tied to enhancer elements, or VDE. What the flip is that? Vitamin D in elements. And since we are already in the nucleus, we can modulate some gene expression. To do what? to absorb calcium and phosphate, reabsorb calcium and phosphate, and modulate calcium and phosphate. 
What are the benefits of vitamin D? Woohoo! Lots of benefits. Direct benefits, indirect benefits. Let's start with direct. You can use it to treat vitamin D deficiency hands down. There's no problem with this. It prevents rickets, it prevents osteomalacia, etc. It might even help with osteoporosis. There is some evidence that vitamin D might prevent or treat diabetes, cognitive impairment slash Alzheimer's dementia, Crohn's disease, autoimmune diseases, and upper respiratory infections, and probably, who knows, this freaking virus. There is some evidence about this. It's not very clear yet. We need more research. And then we have indirect or biochemical benefits. Intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphate, mineralization of bones, immune system modulator, insulin secreta, and blood pressure regulator. Now, pathology land, vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin deficiency is when you have low vitamin levels in your blood, and of course, if it's severe, it will lead to symptoms. And we have two types, primary deficiency and secondary deficiency. Let's review our cases. This dude has GERD. He was given proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole for a very long period of time. We're talking months to years. Developed hypomagnesemia. Without magnesium, you cannot activate vitamin D. Without vitamin D, you get bone fractures, transverse ridging, and muscle dystrophy or muscle problems. Dr. Thomas Sowell moved to Alberta, Canada, the place where the sun does not shine, and then developed bone fracture. This is this did not happen. I'm just uh, hypothesizing. If you're not getting enough sunlight, this can lead to bone fracture. This kid has vitamin D deficiency and has positive Chivistic sign and positive Drousseau sign, because if you have low vitamin D, you will have low calcium and hypocalcemia can lead to tetany, because there is an inverse correlation between calcium level in your blood and the degree of your nerve excitability. Hypocalcemia equals increased nerve excitability, ergo positive Drousseau sign and Chivistic sign. Carpal spasms, pedal spasms, laryngeal spasms, convulsions, etc. Vitamin D deficiency can lead to band keratopathy, muscle dystrophy. If you're not exposed to sunlight or if you're using tons of sunscreen or both, you can get bone fractures. This kid has cystic fibrosis with bronchiectasis, cupfuls of pus, cysts and fibrosis in the pancreas, hence cystic fibrosis. When you have cystic fibrosis, you have malabsorption. Now you cannot absorb fat or fat-soluble vitamins, including vitamin D. That's why he developed transverse ridging of his teeth. This old guy, he was old, obese, with chronic kidney disease. All of these predispose you to vitamin D deficiency and bone fractures. Karen strictly breastfed her baby. And as you know, mommy's milk is awesome, but is deficient in three things. Iron vitamin D, and vitamin K. He was not exposed to sunlight, not given supplements or any fortified food, developed rickets with rachitic rosary, Harrison sulcus, craniotabies, delayed closure of the fontanel, genovarum, pictus carniatum, etc. What are the causes of vitamin D deficiency in adequate exposure to sunlight, especially in cold countries, especially if you have dark skin? Dark skin will protect you from sunlight, and this has pros and cons. Pros, less risk of skin cancer. Cons, more risk of vitamin D deficiency. Hypomagnesemia can lead to vitamin D deficiency, which can lead to hypocalcemia, which can lead to bone fractures. Crohn's disease, especially if you have resected your bowel because you need a robust bowel in order to absorb vitamin D. Liver disease, kidney disease because of the 25-hydroxylase and the 1-alpha-hydroxylase respectively. Fat malabsorption syndrome, old age, any inducers of the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, and primary hypoparathyroidism, like father, like son. If PTH is low, vitamin D will be low, at least the active form. Symptoms of vitamin D deficiency, bone problems. If you're young, it's called rickets. If you're old, it's called osteomalacia. There is some evidence that vitamin D deficiency might be associated with cancer, especially breast cancer, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, and autoimmune disease, endothelial dysfunction, which can lead to heart attacks, cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's dementia. Symptoms of vitamin D deficiency again, bone fractures, transverse ridging, muscle dystrophy, band keratopathy, heart disease, and peripheral arterial disease. 
And of course, bone problems are called rickets in kids, osteomalacia in adults. My great mentor who I've never met once said there are no solutions in life. There are only trade-offs. If you have dark skin, this has pros and cons. If you have light skin, this has pros and cons. These are not categorical differences. These are incremental. There is light skin, there is lighter, 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 and even lighter. And of course, it depends on how much sunlight do you get exposed to. There is little sunlight, moderate level of sunlight, too much sunlight, etc. Having dark skin, pros and cons. Pros protects you against UV light. Cons protects you against UV light. If it protects you against UV light, this can decrease your risk of skin cancer. But it can also decrease skin absorption of vitamin D, leading to vitamin D deficiency. Having light skin, you'll absorb more UV light. This will increase skin absorption of vitamin D, but it can increase your risk of skin cancer. This will be especially pronounced with migrations. Let's say that someone migrated from Nigeria to Alberta, Canada. This person has dark skin. If you're living in sub-Saharan Africa, there is tons of sunlight. You will be okay when it comes to vitamin D. But when you go to Alberta, Canada, there is no sunlight. This person is at a high risk of vitamin D deficiency, so please take vitamin D supplements. Conversely, imagine a Swedish person migrating to Arizona in the United States. It's very hot and his skin is very fair. He is at a tremendous risk of actinic keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and freaking melanoma, so please wear those big hats or apply sunblock all the time. You might also consider tinting the windshield of your car, because there are no solutions in life, only incremental trade-offs. We are done with vitamin D deficiency, let's talk about vitamin D excess or hypervitaminosis D. Too much vitamin D can lead to acute symptoms and chronic symptoms. Acutely, thirst, polyuria, constipation, nausea and vomiting. Chronically, increased serum calcium and increased serum phosphate. This can lead to calcium kidney stones and phosphate kidney stones or calcium phosphate kidney stones. Too much calcium and too much phosphate can lead to metastatic calcification. This is where you have calcification all over your body, in your kidney, in your bronchi, in your whatever, everywhere. Wear. And this can lead to renal failure or chronic kidney disease, which can lead to death. Hypervitaminosis D is associated with idiopathic hypercalcemia or Bowick's sarcoidosis. I've no idea what the flip is this. Some pearls for the pros. Vitamin D deficiency can lead to hypocalcemia, which can lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism as a feedback. If I don't have calcium, let's increase PTH to try to increase the calcium. Hypocalcemia can lead to bone breakdown, trying to increase the calcium, and the high PTH can lead to bone breakdown. And these are mechanisms by which vitamin D deficiency cause rickets or osteomalacia. Did you know that alkaline phosphatase is normally higher in children than in adults? Why is this? Because children are growing. They need bone growth. And of course, osteoblasts secrete alkaline phosphatase. We have two main types of rickets, type 1 and type 2. In medicine, whenever you hear type 1, blame the ligand. Whenever you hear type 2, blame the receptor. Let me explain. The ligand on its own is inactive. The receptor on its own is inactive. It's only the ligand receptor complex which is very active. And that's why pathology can either hit you here, called type 1, or hit you here, called type 2. Case in point, type 1 rickets. It's a deficiency of the freaking enzyme. Type 2, it's the defective zinc finger receptor to the freaking vitamin. You don't believe me? Consider this. What is type 1 diabetes? Oh, there is no insulin. How about type 2? There is insulin, but the receptor is resistant. Uh-huh. How about diabetes insipidus? What is type 1 or central? Oh, there is no ADH. How about type 2 or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Well, there is ADH, it's just the kidney's receptor is not listening. Rickets is the same freaking concept. And this is very similar to when we say plated problems, decreased number or decreased function. 1 and 2, hemophilia, we have decreased number or decreased function. Even asthma treatment, oh, you can decrease number of leukotrienes, such as xylutin, or you can decrease the function or the receptor of the leukotriene, such as giving Montelukast. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. And this is one of my favorite quotes ever. Doing 90% of what's required is one of the biggest wastes because you have nothing to show for all your efforts. But doing 110% of what's expected is one of the smartest investments because it can pay off with big reputation for just a little more effort. 
In other words, my dear student, you need to go above and beyond, not below and underneath. Please don't give up too early. And here is a histology question. Name three substances that can determine your natural skin tone. You'll find the answer in the next video. If you like this video, you will love my antibiotics course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. We talk about antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications. We have videos, we have questions, we have a notebook, we have everything. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium courses. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.